So first and foremost folk, when it comes to the whole argument you're going to hear it a lot for collectivists, in other words just socialists, you hear this argument about capitalism and it's always about the selfishness and the greediness etc etc. The thing is, it's just a, it's a baseless claim because it's just like how they view individualism. Through this self-interest, they're all greedy, they're all you know, off of themselves and it's every man for himself, it's a dog eat dog world and that's what they say. If you've not got welfare statism to force the redistribution of wealth, well wherever would you be? You know, if it was down to that of charity, you would have nothing because folk are greedy, that's why you need this, that and the next thing. You know, it's all contradictory in that. You know, and if it wasn't for collectivism, oh, you know, uh, people wouldn't be doing such and such. So individualism must therefore be just about greediness and self-centeredness etc etc etc. The Finnish Bolshevik goes on to mention about social conditioning. 1. The human nature argument ignores material, socio-economic conditions almost entirely. First of all, human beings don't only behave according to their basic biology or their basic instinctive urges but are largely affected by social conditions and conditioning. Oftentimes, the person's surroundings and environment play even a greater role in their behavior than their biology. For example, humans in certain circumstances behave in drastically different ways in different cultures and different countries. So basically he's trying to say that capitalism and of course the individualism and what we support ignores that of human history. The human nature argument ignores human history almost in its entirety. The human nature argument really tacitly suggests that human nature is not only non-changing, which I've already disproven, but that capitalism and particularly the concept of private property, private ownership of the means of production, are somehow hardwired into humans. That those concepts and the behavior connected with them are inherent in humans. The humans are supposedly naturally capitalistic. Only someone with absolutely no idea about human history could say such a thing. Now, folk, look at the graph here, right? You could go through human history, go back to the days of ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, all the way right up to the days of the Industrial Revolution, and then you'll see a massive spike of the increase in wealth. Now, that didn't happen for nothing. It happened because you actually moved away from collectivism that dominated the world before then. And the way that he paints this world before the Industrial Revolution is almost as if it was simply glory. Now, I don't need to go into it too much because I've already covered it before. I've mentioned about the tragedy of the commons in the starving time and I mentioned how the pilgrims were dying of starvation because of the communal ownership of property. That was the very reason why they were dying of starvation because they never had the freedom to work for the fruits of their own labour. As soon as the private ownership came around, then of course the starvation immediately came to an abrupt end. It was the exact same story when the enclosure movement had occurred in Great Britain because before the enclosure movement, before all the private ownership of agriculture, what you saw across the entire planet Earth was periodical famines. Right, so in other words, life was simply awful. Mothers had no food to cook, the children had no food on their tables. They actually viewed the factories as salvation. Right, that's how awful life was. These people had common malnutrition diseases, such as beriberi, scurvy, rickets, and you could even argue that living conditions were far worse than, you know, of course, the poorest parts of Africa today, back in that period, because of the fact that they never had medicine, they never had electricity, so life just wasn't exactly as wonderful as what he's making it to be. Before the Industrial Revolution, all you would see was wars, right? All the invasions, all the wars across Europe, countries, you know, fighting one another. It, it, it goes right through the whole of human history. It's sad to say that we've never lived as good as it is today. Just the truth, and I'm not talking about living conditions, I'm talking about as peaceful as, as we are today. You had imperialism, you had colonialism, theocracy, of course, and f feudalism. Now, let's just take my country, for example. You know, you had all the clan wars, you know, they were all fighting one another. Like I say, it was it was dictatorial, because a young boy, Thomas Aikenhead, for example, you know, he's all, I think he was only about 18 year old, and he was hung at the gallows in 16, 97 I think, I'm pr pretty sure it was. And why? Because the fact that he read atheism in the library as well, of course, he spoke blasphemy of God and Jesus. Now in those days you were only allowed to speak freely, to even read or write. They purposely dumbed you down to control you and that's how things were. 
I'm not saying there was no parts of the world that was no an anarchist etc. To say that collectivism had been simply glorious for the people was just absolute nonsense so to speak. Before the industrial revolution they worked more than 80 hours per week. As I pointed out before, Fernand Braudel, a French historian, wrote about a terrible winter in 1695 where the peasants were freezing, starving and dying in their hovels, which gives you an idea that it wasn't exactly this wonderful picture that they've got in their head. King Louis XIV in the Palace of Versailles stared down in his wine glass that had frozen over. I mean, the average poor person of the day is living far better off than that of the King of France of 1695 and coincidentally you would see in the late 18th century a French revolutionary would say happiness is a new idea in Europe. Why would a French revolutionary come out and say that? They say it for shits and giggles? They say it for nothing? No, he says it because life was just absolutely abysmal. You socialists going about capitalism and say about, you know, working endless hours for such little pay? Well, surely that's working endless hours for such little pay. See the wages that they were getting paid on the farms before the Industrial Revolution? It was substantially less than the earliest poorest factories. Real wage earning growth rate in Great Britain was unprecedented. That means it's never been seen before in human history. For what I've got of his argument, a lot of it's based on, you know, theory. You know, theory of anarchism, theory that socialism's different. Just have a wee listen to what he goes on to say here. The human nature argument confuses communism and socialism. Despite everything else wrong with this argument, and there's a lot, this is perhaps the most important and the easiest to counter it with. The argument simply confuses communism and socialism. Actually, the argument should be targeted towards anarchism and not Marxism-Leninism. So as you can hear, he's trying to, you know, differentiate this whole thing today with, you know, socialism and communism and all the rest of it, and then goes on about anarchism. Christian Yemyets in his book, Socialism, the Failed Idea That Never Dies, even he goes on to mention about the fact that, you know, all they mention is about their aspirations. Their aspirations for democracy. Well, what do you think every single one of these socialist regimes tried? Every one of them says that they were pushing for this democratic socialism. Every single attempt they said that they were going to achieve it and they failed or and or and or. They don't realise that it doesn't matter what you've got in theory. What does that matter in the face of economic reality? That doesn't mean anything. It, it, it doesn't mean a, a single thing. What does it matter if, you, if you've got a theory today with a moneyless economy that's classless and stateless? So I will say that. But when you go to put it in practice, you're gonna need to try and get rid of the private sector. So how are you gonna achieve that? Well, you're gonna need someday that's a dictator, because somebody like a Bernie Sanders is not going to do it. Somebody like that of a Jeremy Corbyn is not going to do it. They, they've not got the backbone to do it. It requires a specific character to take you there. A Nicolas Maduro. It requires a, a Fidel Castro. Even if that was the case, who's to say that the state would just wither away? And even then, Again, in practice, you're faced with the economic calculation problem. I argued with somebody before, and I mentioned about, of course, human nature. Because this guy, this guy says to us, humanity is more important than economics. And I says to him, not no. See anybody that turns around and says that to you? You know for a fact they do not understand how important economics is. They don't. How do you know that for a fact? Well, tell me something. See if economics does not matter. Right? See if economics just, you, you could just take economics and just bar it aside and it just doesn't matter. Then you could just impose any policy that you like and you can just forget about consequences. Really? If that's the case then, during the oil boom, because this is Venezuela we're talking about here, and even, you know, the young boy, you know, mouthy infidel, he tried to say, oh well, it was because Saudi Arabia ramped up oil production and that's what caused the oil prices to plummet and therefore this is what caused the food shortage crisis, etc. Funny that is because the oil boom began two weeks before Hugo Chavez took over and it lasted right up to 2007. The food shortage crisis began in 2003 at the exact same time when the price controls were imposed. That's no coincidence. 
That's economic reality. It's called understanding economics. It's called understanding that when you set down a government price ceiling, you're setting down a price shortage problem. It's caused because that is the natural state of what happens when you try to artificially reduce the price below market value and you set a price ceiling. The same story happened with the shortage at the pump in 1974 in Great Britain and it was the same story in the United States of America. Massive big queues, as soon as the, you know, the price ceiling was removed, the price shortage problem immediately disappeared. The point that I'm getting at, you can't just turn a blind eye to economics and say, ah, well, you know, who cares about economics, so just, you know, bat it aside, it, just, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> how, how can you? How do you think millions of people between 1995 and 1998 starved to death in North Korea? Well, that happened because of the fact that the Jushi idea policy was put in place. It's not just a case that, oh well, we can just do whatever we like. Millions of people died of starvation. You saw that in the Great Leap Forward. More than 40 million people died of starvation simply because of the centralisation of agriculture. And the funny thing is, you go back in history and you go back to the period of the starving time, when 103 pilgrim settlers settled into Jamestown and within a space of six months, despite having a large quantity of seafood, deer or turkey surrounding them and fertile soil to grow their own food, what happened? All oh, but 38 of them died due to starvation and disease. Same story, two years later, into 1609, they resettled another 500 pilgrims and a staggering 440 of them died due to starvation and disease. Why did that happen? Because the communal ownership of agriculture was responsible for it. Why was it responsible for it? It was caused because when Sir Thomas Dale was sent over from Great Britain to identify the problem, they saw that the reason for why the starvation occurred was the free rider problem. In other words, it was caused by the absence of secure private property rights. The starvation was basically caused by the absence of people being able to freely work for the fruits of their own labour. You know, it's, I don't even think folk understand just how dangerous it is that you think you can just, you know, get rid of capitalism and there'll be no consequences and it'll just all be humanitarian. It's all for humanitarian sake. See folk who don't understand economics, they think it's just a case that, oh well, we can just do whatever we want and we'll just, we'll just go back to living like we did before the Industrial Revolution. Interesting that is, because see before all the machines, those folk were working back-breaking hours from day until night for more than 80 hours per week. It wasn't it because of government legislation that reduced your working hours? Government had nothing at all to do with it. The reason why your working hours reduced was because of the machines. Had it not been for the machines, your life would be miserable. You know, at the end of the day, life wasn't exactly wonderful, I'll tell you that. The life expectancy even was absolutely terrible. In fact, so much so, economic historian Ralph Reichel, who sadly passed away in 2016, he mentioned the whole of human history, dating right back to the Paleolithic age. The women were under the thumb of the male. In other words, they were slaves. They had no life. He's gone on and on about human nature and he goes on about poverty. And this is the other thing in his video. Just have a listen to what he says here. In the world, social ills such as alcoholism, drug abuse and violent crime are always higher in areas with high unemployment rates and poverty. Clearly, this shows that human behavior is greatly altered by the material conditions in which those humans live. I think it's completely unscientific to even try to deny this. Just look at examples of feral children who behave not only differently from humans in other cultures, but actually more like animals than humans in many respects. Although after a lengthy process, they sometimes, once again, begin to adapt more human-type behavior. Clearly, this comes from their surroundings. Their basic biology never changes during this process. Therefore, we must accept that social and economic conditions can change human behavior, and if that is the case, then it's completely reasonable to think that such social and economic conditions can be created where humans act more cooperatively and altruistically. Even when it goes on about the whole thing today we, you know, this capitalism developed to this and capitalism did this and that and then this, that and the next thing, oh and it's just a case that capitalism developed into this new type of capitalism. Private property is actually a very new concept in human culture not to mention how new capitalism is. 
This argument presupposes that capitalism is eternal, and when in fact it is completely obvious that it, that it is a very new phenomena that is liable to unprecedented crises and that relies on infinite growth, ever-expanding markets and so on, in a finite world. It is a system which by its very nature is unstable and bound to crash as it, as it frequently does. It is also one that will inevitably destroy this planet and all human life on it if it's allowed to continue and therefore it can hardly be called eternal. Even capitalism itself is subject to constant change and not at all static like nothing is. Capitalism has changed in a fundamental way from its classical stage into a global monopoly capitalism. No, 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 that's dishonesty. Why is it dishonesty, folk? Because you're living under a mixed economy, folk. In order for a mixed economy to exist, there has to be the mixture between capitalism and socialism. So how the hell do you go for capitalism, which is, you know, the freedom of the market, free from government intervention, to what you're living under today with a strongly mixed-based economy. You introduce socialism into the economy. So how the hell is that a new type of capitalism? <laughs> and I've argued with him before in the past, and I can't even be bothered, you know, doing the argument again. It's on the economic calculation problem. I might respond to you, of course, Xizi's argument on that. He's living under this mixed economy, and it was socialism, through all the socialist government interventionism, that gave rise to all of the monopolies, the cartels, the collusions, the oligopolies, etc, etc, etc. That's why you've got all these problems today. That's why you've got the inflationary problems. They threw all the socialist fractional reserve banking. And he makes a baseless claim and he says about the whole issue today we Oh, you know, capitalism ends in crisis. It's like this type of person who picks up a book by Naomi Klein. Somebody who hasn't even got a clue about economics, disaster capitalism, and she wrote an utter load of crap about capitalism, right? Claiming that capitalism ends in crisis. What the hell has, you know, fixing the ratio of money got to do with capitalism? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And what caused the booms and bust cycles of the 19th century was nothing at all to do with the gold standard. That was the day with the trying and testing of the paper currency. That was the greenback currency that caused that. That's what led to the panic of 1893. Even when they, they messed things up and they tried to fix the ratio, right under Alexander Hamilton in the 1790s, he tried to fix the ratio between gold and silver. It ended up wiping gold out of the market, made silver the dominant standard, right up to about 1834, and in 1834 they tried to get gold to enter the treasury this time while keeping on into silver. What happened? Lo and behold, silver is wiped out the market, gold becomes the dominant standard. In other words, had it been left down to capitalism, had it been left down to the free market, that problem would never have occurred. But apparently it's all down to capitalism's fault. Same story in the 20th century. They try to blame capitalism on the boom and bust cycle. How is it the fault of capitalism? It's a central bank that's fixing the interest rates. That's what's caused the booms and busts of the 20th century. That's why you're facing this problem today. That's got nothing to do with with capitalism. That's today when the very fact is you're trying to fix the interest rates through the use of socialism and it is through the use of socialism because a, a, a capitalist system means that the capitalist system regulates itself. It means the interest rates are left be to regulate itself in the free market through the laws of supply and demand. It doesn't mean that what you have is some sort of system where you've got a central banking system controlling and manipulating interest rates. All he's doing is making baseless claims and hoping that what he states to you sticks. Where in history have you ever seen socialism avoid poverty? Where have you ever seen it? <laughs> where, where have you ever seen it? You never saw it in the Soviet Union. You know, you never saw it in China. You never saw it in Cuba, Argentina, or anywhere else that, that socialism's been. Every single socialist regime ended in disaster. And it's no been a case that they didn't try democratic socialism. Oh, they tried it alright. They even tried it in Albania when they tried to distance themselves from that, the likes of the Soviet Union. And they tried to turn towards all these different regimes. And each and every single one of them failed miserably. It's always a case that they go through the honeymoon phase, just like the Soviet Union of the seven, the, sorry, the 1930s, and then after the whole, you know, honeymoon phase, they then enter the phase of, you know, it's just a whataboutery, 
oh but you know what about you know such and such look at look at what capitalism's doing it's, it's always a case trying to point the, the, the finger elsewhere and say oh look what such and such is doing right and then once it en- enters the third phase the third phase is basically the phase where nobody really can defend it anymore it's become such an abysmal failure that nobody would ever defend it they try to distance themselves from it and then they go all quiet and then they, they they end up using all the excuses and they say, oh, but that was not true socialism. Always the case, folk. Theory will never trump practice. And the very reason why millions died at the hands of communism is because of the fact that when, of course, the dictatorship came around and it's the only way they can try and get rid of this, you know, self-interest for human beings. When they try to force the issue through dictatorship, those who seek self-interest to try to escape such regimes were shot in the back of the head. What can I say? I mean, it's been throughout human history that you've seen collectivism over and over and over, and it's been a disaster throughout human history. You, know, you can't you can't show anywhere in human history where collectivism's ever been beneficial, and he even tries to sneak the wee bit in about imperialism or colonialism. They're collectivist. How can you correlate imperialism and colonialism, which are both collectivist, to that of an individualist system known as capitalism? And he also says about capitalism, you know, as if it's just something new. No, 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 no. Capitalism's been around since the days, the first days of barter. That's going way back to the days of the ancient Greece. When you oppose capitalism every single time, without failure, Every single time, it's led in disaster. And I, I, I wouldn't even dare call those regimes humanitarian. So a number of questions that I got, obviously, from the previous video. Dios goes on to say, The more we produce through automation, the cheaper things will eventually become, even so much that goods will cost a fraction of the price compared to now. If this happens, more people will be able to afford a lot of more goods than they previously did. Effectively, this will lift everyone into a wealthier situation. Jason Unruh lives in a fantasy world. He thinks like a extreme paranoid schizophrenic that the businessman is always out to get him. You're absolutely right in what you said, Dios. I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes down to that of higher levels of productivity and that, and you bring down the cost and that, it improves people's lives overall. Like I said, I mean, the, the free market's uh, the way forward in terms of efficiency and lifts people to a greater level of wealth and that. I think a lot of folk, it's just what I spoke about there in terms of the humanitarian thing. You know, like I've had the argument before where somebody starts going on about consumerism. Folk honestly take things for granted today. They, they honestly do. I'm, I'm not even joking, right? See folk just get rid of everything that they had. All machines, everything. You name it. They don't understand the fact that when they go to the local supermarket and they pick up goods such as the food, how do they think all those goods reach the shelves? How do they think the refrigerator got there? See if you done away with the refrigerator and that, how would you store food then? Oh, that takes work alone. It would have to be, uh, you know, stored underground. And then if you take away the machines, they're reliant upon the farmers. It would end up leading to starvation. But the point being is the fact that they would be left to work with their horns. They just think of economics is just something, oh well, that's it, you know, it just lands there and they, they, they take things for granted. See if you actually forced them to live in that way of life, like the way life was be- before then, they wouldn't like it at all, I'll tell you that. Voluntarist Jeff goes on to say, You know more me- than me, man, and yet you're a monarchist. I respect you, man. But Rothbard for a new liberty if you ever want to imagine a society without government. As I say, you know, at the end of the day, Voluntarist Jeff, I uh, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate, obviously, your comment and that. Like I say, I mean, I take great influence for the Mises Institute. You know, I admire the likes of Rothbard and, and stuff and I'm currently reading through, you know, his book and that. And I took influence that reading through the economic history is something that I love. It's my interest and that's the reason why. Because like I say, I mean, before I gathered such information for others, when it came to Ludwig von Mises, I gathered such information from the likes of Tom Woods, etc. It's not that I don't trust Tom Woods and that, but it'd be nice to actually, you know, read it for his own person perspective. Arshinwari says, I think you need to inform your viewers about your Discord server. Definitely folk, of course, check down at the 
description below and you'll find my discord and you can obviously get there I managed to find out how you actually make it permanent if you want to join my discord server or that and of course you can join there Adam CX goes on to mention what do you think of market socialism really all market socialism is is basically the mixed economy the market which is today with capitalism and that of course today with socialism I know you've obviously mentioned things yourself you would support mutualism and stuff like that seeing a free market you can freely choose to work with others if you want and work in collective groups there's nothing stopping you but in terms of socialism it's all about political centralization it basically contradicts the market it's the rejection of the market and that's what socialism is of course that's what i was trying to mention to that of mouthy infidel but like i said i mean it's like talking to a brick wall peewee goes on to mention does jason not realize that people who invent the ai can have full control of its capabilities and how it operates they were able to invent such thing so of course they'd be able to control it and they most certainly will control it but hey leave it for the commies to deny reality it's quite an interesting point of course that you raised there and i did leave it out there was a sophia robot that you probably already know about and of course sophia had came out and mentioned certain things politically that the left didn't like and so they ended up rewiring it reframing it if you actually look at these amazon things i think it's called echo or that through these devices you speak to it it speaks back to you, it gives you information. Folk have already posted it on the likes of YouTube videos showing that these things, it's laughable because they always give you back the sort of answers that are, you know, pro-socialist or pro-left wing. Everything is like this bias. There is a, a level of control there. Magicide 84 says automation will not destroy jobs. Hmm, wasn't the same thing said about the outsourcing you know, factory jobs decades ago? This guy is badly underestimated making how things will play out if and when companies take mass machine automation and AI in the workplace to its full logical conclusion. Well, not really. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, consumers need money in their pockets. They're the ones who, you know, demand things. So they need money in order to spend, so they need jobs. There's been examples, I mean, take for example, 800,000 jobs were lost, yet 3 million jobs were created, and it's been like that for decades. In fact, it's been like that for more than a century long period. It was like that right throughout the Industrial Revolution, it was like that right throughout the 20th century, and artificial intelligence hasn't made any difference in that matter. All that happens is jobs are reallocated in the market. And again, Adam Sihek goes on to mention, doesn't capitalism overproduce too much? Well, no, not really. It costs you more to produce and it costs you more to use more resources. So if you want to maximise your profits, you're going to minimise your costs. It's not a case that you know businesses can just produce as much as they like and throw it out there because at the end of the day, they want to be able to sell and make a profit. They don't want to make losses. What's the point in overproducing? Putting it out there on the market and a certain number don't sell. So there's no point in that. You're always taking a chance. These companies gather the information of profits and they get it from consumer demand. And consumer demand is obviously telling them the information of how much to produce. You know, and even if they do overproduce, then that you know, if they can't sell off enough, then they, they will reduce the price to try and sell off and then that's it. So anyway, folk, I hope that's been educational for yourself. If you get any questions in and you'd like to add yourself, comment in the comment section below. And of course, I'll be sure to get back to you. Cheers.